don't know how long she is to get the speakers. I'm just here to be surrounded by all of my academic heroes. Um, so I have an interesting idea as well. So I think I'm just going to just stick with the introductions, but then as when can establish uh, introductions that probably are necessary to this audience. I'm going to stick with the announcements. Um, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Dharam Nosley from UMass Amherst. He'll be telling us about um, uh, quantum internet type of thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm really tickled and honored to, to be here to be able to help celebrate uh, Jean's uh, retirement. Uh, um, I guess I'll just say a couple of things uh, about uh, our interactions over career. I think that probably we cross paths the least of all of the, uh, let's say, the speakers here, but I've known of Jean's work from, you know, the I'm going to say the 70s, 1980. And at one point, I was just fascinated with the work on sort of coupling arguments and everything. And I have to say, I spent so much time trying to understand uh, it so that I could sort of make use of it. And at some point, I finally was able to sort of write some papers. But I really think of them all as sort of copies of, of work that you had done. Uh, the other thing was, one uh, semester after you came out with your queuing networks textbook, I decided to use it. And uh, I was struck by uh, both the breadth that it was covering analysis, control, and modeling, uh, and also at the same time, how you sort of think way beyond people like myself. And so you see th that step. And when I see what you uh, sort of have as the next step, I then found, uh, for the sake of the students, I had to spend hours sometimes trying <laughs> to fill in that step. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, I think most any other person who had attempted to write that textbook would have uh, written one that would have been 750 to 1,000 pages instead of the whatever was 350, 400 pages. Okay, in any case, I'm really sort of glad to be here. Um, I guess I'm gonna be talking about sort of a different topic than what we've seen. The other thing is that there, you're gonna find very little math in this particular talk, but I'm hoping that it'll raise some consciousness in terms of what might be some interesting problems to be looking at. Um, we're gonna start off, uh, I don't know how many here know any quantum theory, so I'm gonna give you sort of quantum theory 101. Then I'll talk about entanglement networks, which is what uh, this uh, talk is all about. And then I'd like to talk about sort of research issues. Uh, I'm gonna use an example of uh, application that I worked on with uh, some of my collaborators to sort of try to illustrate some of that and then summarize. Okay, so elementary quantum 101. Okay, well, we're familiar with sort of the uh, digital technology, you have a bit, it has only two values, zero and one. There are lots of ways that you can represent it. The canonical example, of course, is a light bulb off on, but it could be low or high voltage in a, a circuit. Uh, but what we're interested in are quantum bits, and uh, it's termed a qubit, and it basically corresponds to a two-state <laughs> quantum mechanical system. And, and a canonical example is sort of like photon polarization, where you can have polarization in sort of like horizontal plane, or, and you could have it in the vertical plane. And um, these uh, two states then are sort of represented as using bracket notation like this. But as uh, Daria said, it's basically glorified linear algebra in terms of sort of uh, what goes on here. Okay, but the thing is that you can have the polarization any combination of the two. Okay, and so you can have sort of a superposition of states. If you think of it, what I showed you in the previous slide is really sort of a basis for what you can sort of build. And so we can have a, uh, a state phi, which is essentially a combination of these two uh, sort of basis vectors. And uh, these coefficients in front, the important thing is that when you square them and sum them, they uh, equal one, okay? Um, and there are a number of sort of like 
important uh, superposition states. I've just sort of uh, listed a couple here, um, and uh, they're really just sort of linear combinations of the uh, two basis vectors. Okay. Now, because of uh, the way that I said it, you have an uncountable number of states, okay? And so you can have, let's say, a photon that's in a, a particular state, and you send it through sort of a, a, a filter, and what will happen is you'll get an outcome being one of those two uh, basis states. Uh, you'll either get uh, X or you'll get Y, okay? You don't get both, and it turns out that it's completely random. If you repeat this experiment many, many times, what you'll find is that the probability or the fraction of times that you, let's say, get an X out uh, is given by the square of the coefficient that was in front, and likewise Y, that it's uh, beta squared. Okay. And so that's a sort of a physical interpretation of alpha and beta. Well, I talk about this with one qubit, but you can have uh, multiple qubits. And so with two qubits uh, represented like this, uh, we have sort of four basis states in that case. And any sort of superposition of two qubits then would just be written as this uh, combination. Uh, and I'll just mention again, there are a number of superposition states that are sort of important and, and useful in quantum. Uh, one of them is called the Bell state, and it corresponds uh, to this. It's a superposition of the 0, 0 and the 1, 1, and this, of course, is just to make sure that everything is normalized properly. Okay, so let's look at this. It turns out that this is really a very useful uh, superposition. Suppose that what you do, okay, you've got these two qubits, and the first thing you do is you measure the first one, the way that I mentioned uh, passing it, let's say, through a filter. And it's going to yield either a zero or a one, okay? Now, it turns out if you get a one, and then you go to measure the second qubit, you're always going to get a one. And likewise, if you had measured the zero, then measuring the second qubit yields a zero. And that turns out to be incredibly powerful. Uh, I should mention that there are other kinds of measurement correlations that you can sort of uh, play around with in quantum. But the important thing is that this sort of entanglement between these two qubits is sort of the basis of quantum computing, uh, quantum key distribution, quantum sensing, and, and so on. And so a lot of, of what's uh, uh, needed is to have ways of sort of generating and propagating these entanglements uh, as sort of like a, a primitive to be used for these other applications. Okay, so suppose that the way that I sort of described it, it's sort of easy to think of it. You're in the lab, you have the two qubits, you measure one, the other one comes out uh, to be the same. But what you, for it to be useful, you'd like to be able to have these qubits uh, separate them out to, let's say, two completely different parties, okay? And so you might have a, a superposition state uh, at Alice, and what Alice would like to do is to propagate the second qubit uh, to Bob. And so um, it could be over an optical fiber, it's got some sort of transmittivity. Uh, let's say the distance is L, and what's going to happen is that it, uh, Alice is going to send photon that's sort of uh, corresponding to that. It could uh, get uh, lost. It could get lost at some point. It makes it, and now Bob has uh, that second qubit. And it's been shown that the rate at which you can sort of do this at is for sort of small values of transmittivity, it's, it's essentially linear in the transmittivity, okay? And the transmittivity uh, turns out to be an exponentially decaying function of the length uh, or the distance between the two, okay? And so that, uh, what that has resulted in is that you can sort of do this, let's say, uh, directly between Alice and Bob, 
for distances that might be on the order of tens of kilometers. Uh, maybe in space it would be much, much farther. But you can't do this on sort of like a national or intercontinental uh, level. And so what that suggests is what we would like then is some kind of a quantum network that would allow us to be able to do that, where we have Alice, we have Bob, there's some uh, uh, path to uh, Bob and that they would somehow be able to generate an end-to-end -end entanglement uh, between them. And if we could do that, then that would essentially allow lots of, of different applications, uh, secure communications, as was alluded to by Daria, uh, distributed quantum computing. That's becoming sort of really very much of interest because uh, companies are now being able to build small quantum computers, but if they really wanted to have many, many qubits available to them uh, at this point and probably for many years, they'd have to be able to connect lots of them. And there, of course, are undoubtedly lots of applications yet to be done. So in order to do that, you need to have sort of repeaters uh, uh, to be able to generate these end-to-end -end entanglements. And so I want to sort of describe the process quickly at a high level of how uh, an entanglement would be created. The first thing you would do, uh, these are the repeaters right here. Uh, there might be, uh, think of it as, let's say, a bunch of channels between each of them. They're referred to as modes. They could be different frequencies in the optical domain. They, it could be a time division uh, kind of thing. And the first thing that is attempted is to create entanglements just between neighboring repeaters. Okay, and let's say the p naught's the probability that uh, it will uh, succeed, then uh, uh, all you need is for one of these to succeed, let's say this one here, and that's going to be with probability p given by this expression when you have m modes. Oh, the n here is think of the distance, it's measured in terms of the number of links, number of repeaters. Okay, and then once that's done, that can all be done at the same time, uh, you tr then splice these links together using uh, what are called Bell state measurements. Okay, and there's a probability that that will success, uh, which I'll call Q. And so that would be attempted, let's say, here, 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 and if they succeed, then you'll have an end to end entanglement between uh, Alice and Bob. And what I'm going to do really for the rest of the talk is I'm going to just sort of think of it as looking like this, as if there's really only one mode uh, between uh, the repeaters, some probability P of successfully getting a link entanglement, Q of splicing, okay. And so now you can think of a, a quantum entanglement network then would be Lots of these connected together, just as you sort of uh, would see for a classical network. And this would now allow, you could you know, connect multiple users, and so they could all be these different uh, pairs of users trying to generate end-to-end -end entanglements. Or you could think of it that you have multiple paths per user pair, and so you could try to sort of take advantage of, of let's say, the path diversity that you might have. And so uh, I'll be talking about that. Uh, first, just a, a slide of sort of challenges in terms of performance and control. Uh, this area is really completely in its infancy. And so the questions just abound. Given pairs of users, what's the capacity region for this? What's the right way to sort of allocate resources among these uh, various uh, user pairs? Um, sh should you do stateless or stateful control? And I'll talk a little bit about that in the context of a, a, uh, an example. Uh, should you do like set up static routes, maybe using some sort, something like an internet protocol? Or should you be opportunistic as uh, you can do in wireless? Um, Suppose that you have uh, a particular sort of uh, set of mechanisms. You know, how do you go about modeling latency? 
um, if, uh, because, of course, it's going to take some time. It's, uh, the time before and then the entanglement is created is random. OK, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to turn to a, a piece of work that I did with uh, colleagues that I had listed in, in the uh, first slide, uh, sort of looking a little bit at state information and path diversity. And I should mention that we sort of uh, uh, undertook this as physicists would using sort of simulation, numerical simulation. And so uh, to me, one of the things I hope you get out of this is that there's really a lot of room for theoretical development. A simple 2D grid network. Uh, we're going to assume there's just one mode per link, um, just one memory per repeater per link. So it looks like that uh, diagram I had at the bottom of the slide earlier. And let's start off, there's just one pair of nodes that want to, to generate entanglements. Okay, so here's, here's the picture of our uh, grid network with, I don't know, let's say Alice is here, Bob is here, there's some probability P that you can generate an entanglement across a link. Uh, and uh, the, uh, if we sort of uh, follow the recipe that I, I described to you before, in the first phase, you try to create as many link entanglements as possible. And maybe this is the result of that first phase, okay? And then in the second phase, you decide uh, which pairs of links to try to splice together. Uh, notice here there's no question about what to do, but you have to decide, let's say in this case, which pair um, and, uh, and so on. And so uh, here what I've done is uh, sort of uh, done a particular one. And uh, I think what we find is that the result is that you actually have two paths uh, between Alice and Bob. And so in this particular operation, uh, he, they are able to generate two bits of entanglement. Uh, I didn't mention a, a, a bit of entanglement is, oft, is referred to as an e-bit in the quantum world. <clears throat> okay, so now what we're interested in is what, what's the rate at which Alice and Bob can generate these entanglements? Yes? Sorry, could you, I, I was very slow there. So if there are two links and they're both entangled, does that imply that, you know, A to B, B to C, does that mean A to C is entangled? Or what is a physical, because they're um, two different photons, right? They're two different pairs of photons. So... I'm not quite sure what your question is. So uh, let's say uh, this node may decide to try to splice this together. The, this node splice this together, likewise this. It's all done simultaneously. And at the end, if it's successful, then the, uh, let's say the, uh, there's an entanglement, let's say, between Alice and Bob. Yeah, I, I guess I can ask offline. I just don't okay. understand what splice was. Yeah. Okay, so what we're interested in is, you know, what's the rate at which these entanglements can be generated? And so here is an attempt to, to sort of get an idea, but let's say where we have sort of an offline algorithm. And so we looked at a greedy shortest path algorithm. Okay, this is not optimal. The first thing you do is you've, uh, once you've generated these two phases, and, uh, and oh, well, excuse me, once you generate the first phase, then you see what the shortest path is that you could uh, generate by doing these splices. Um, and then after you do that, what's the next one you could do and the next one, okay? And so I'm just gonna refer to that as greedy and it requires global information. And let's say that this is what the, uh, the entanglement rate is. And so here I'm sort of showing uh, uh, what the rate looks like as a function of the distance in the x-axis and in the y-axis between Alice and Bob, okay? Uh, for a, a link success probability 0.55 and perfect 
bell state measurements, perfect splices. And then this is what you get if the link success probability is 0.45. I have a question, anybody know? So here, it's pretty constant. It doesn't depend on the distance, but here there's clearly a decay. Uh, does somebody want to tell me what the reason is? Okay. Right, right. It turns out that's just, uh, I was thinking of what uh, Daria was saying about percolation, is here we're above the percolation threshold for a 2D grid when we do uh, um, bond uh, percolation, and here we're just below. Uh, that's what's going on. Okay, so now suppose, so that was an offline algorithm. Um, let, uh, uh, that uses perfect knowledge. Let's see if we can generate an upper bound of what's uh, possible, okay? If it turns out that the splices can be done successfully, uh, these bell state measurements are perfect, then you can just run a max flow algorithm and you can find the, the achievable uh, rate uh, with global information. Uh, Unfortunately, if uh, there's some probability that one of these splices will fail, there is, at least we don't know of an algorithm for uh, obtaining, and so we just have a very simple upper bound that just takes four times uh, the, the, uh, the rate that you get from that greedy algorithm I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. And so here's, um, uh, the upper bound with, uh, let's say, uh, link success probability 0.6, perfect uh, splices. Uh, here is what you get running that greedy algorithm that I mentioned in the previous slide. And then here's what you get running the greedy algorithm where 10% uh, of the time you fail to connect two links. And this is the upper bound that you obtain. And I guess something I didn't mention, uh, what we're doing is looking at the log of the rate. Okay, so, so the, ga the difference between this is essentially uh, four. Okay, now let's see what we could do just using local state information, okay? Uh, one of the, the problems is, okay, so you can do these, uh, these uh, link entanglements all in parallel. You can do these splices or bell state measurements all in parallel, but in order to be able to use global information, you'd have to propagate the information uh, having to do with the success of the link uh, experiments everywhere before you could f do the second phase. And, and clearly that's not something that one can, can do. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to assume that uh, each node, each repeater knows its Euclidean distance from Alice and from Bob. Okay, so that's the, I guess, the global information uh, that it will make use of. And so here, from the perspective of you, it knows what the distances are for its uh, four neighbors, okay? So it runs the first phase, and if this is the only link that succeeded, there's nothing uh, that you has to do. Um, if two links uh, uh, created entanglements, well, that's easy. There's only one choice. If there are three, now the greedy or the algorithm that we're gonna use is just that you're gonna connect the two that sort of uh, create potentially the shortest path between Alice and Bob, okay? And so when you look at, let's say, the distance from uh, Alice, uh, a distance from Bob for this node, and likewise for this, and for this, when you sum them up, you realize this, potentially this will result in the shortest path. And if all four succeed, then you do the same thing, you first of all find the potentially the shortest path, and then after that you go ahead and just splice the other two together, okay? And so I'm gonna refer to the rate that you get as R loc, and uh, 
Here I'm showing you the, uh, the rate for the greedy algorithm. Here's what you get if you use this local rule. And then what we're going to compare against is the rate that you would get if you had decided to just allocate single static paths between Alice and Bob. Okay, and let's say, and so this is uh, of the same distance, uh, in which case you have no diversity here, and that's the, this uh, curve, this uh, surface right here. And you notice that uh, uh, both of them have an exponential decay, but the decay is much faster for the, the linear. And so uh, you're getting benefit from sort of uh, allowing this diversity. Okay, I'm going to just say a little bit about multi-flow routing. And again, it's more just to sort of raise questions. Let's take a, a setting where we have two Alice's, two Bob's, and uh, Alice, both cases, is above Bob, okay? Now, you could do the following. You could just say, well, I'll give the entire set of resources to, Al to the first pair, uh, and then the next time slot to the second pair, or some other kind of multiplexing. And if you do that, uh, you would get this as the, the rate region for that uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, or another possibility is what you might do is just divide the resources, let al uh, each pair have its own set of resources, and they could proceed in parallel. And if you do that, you get uh, a, a little bit of an increase in the rate region. And then the third is you, you do, as I said before, but whenever there are Let's say operations are going to result in a failure, let's say for Alice 1 and Bob 1. You allow those resources to be used by Alice, the second pair. And what's interesting in that case is you actually can get a huge uh, improvement in, in the rate region by doing that. Uh, here's another configuration. Again, uh, just to sort of give you a sense of issues. Now here, they're clearly sort of like uh, at odds with each other. Uh, they have to sort of use, go through the same part of the network in order to be able to communicate with them. And so if they do time division multiplexing, that's this blue curve right here. If they sort of split the resources, um, let's say by, uh, let's say this hourglass belonging to pair one, and this hourglass to pair two or the bow tie, and you have uh, you know, some sort of parameter that decides how to do it. Then interestingly enough, you can get uh, this as the rate region. And then finally, if you allow resources in the hourglass to be used for Alice two and Bob two when they can't help uh, Alice one and Bob one, you get some additional improvement right there. Okay? so. So um, that uh, brings me to, to the end. I just want to sort of mention open questions. Uh, let's say here is, you know, I've, I've given you really a bunch of heuristics, and so there's really a question of what, what is uh, the rate optimal protocol for this system? Um, something that I glossed over, we, we, everything was under the assumption there's only one memory per link, one mode on each link, and so, you know, once you sort of allow for multiple modes and multiple memories, uh, there may be ideas that can come from uh, queuing theory, perhaps, that could be applied here. So, uh, something else I didn't mention is these qubits don't stay around forever. Uh, they have a sort of a finite time that uh, they'll exist at a decent quality, and then they just sort of fall apart. And so there's... Uh, that's referred to as coherence time, and so that's something that sort of adds another dimension. Uh, there's this notion of purification that when you do an entanglement, I've been sort of talking about it as if it's perfect, and uh, they, the results can be of variable quality, and by sort of repeating the, the same operation over and over again, you can purify and increase the quality of the entanglement.
um, that comes up. Um, and last is I've talked about everything in terms of it's an end-to-end -end pair of nodes that want to create an entanglement. And uh, there are other kinds of entanglements that, uh, let's say, uh, include m more than two qubits. And I think of that as sort of uh, starts to seem like a multicast or group communications in classical networking. Okay, so, so the conclusions, um, quantum repeater networks achieve a much better performance than linear chains, even just for a single pair of users, and even if you just use local information. And with multi-flows, it looks like you should exploit uh, spatial uh, information. And I'll, I'll just say that you know, the research here is really in its infancy, and that I, I think there are just many exciting problems. And what I'd like to leave uh, uh, to you, Jean, um, in this uh, retirement uh, celebration is, do you need a new hobby? <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, why don't you think of doing this? And then I can move on to another uh, research topic. <laughs> OK, uh, that uh, brings me to the end. Thanks. Uh, so we have time for maybe a couple of questions. So don't, given Just the coherence uh, problem, the type of networks that we are thinking of, let's say, that, that could be implemented within the next, let's say, 10 years, would those be kind of interconnection networks between quantum processors on a single chip? Or um, you well, you know, that, that's interesting. When I first started, I was really thinking wide area network. I think that probably the initial sweet spot is think of it as a data center with a lot of small quantum computers that need to be connected. And so it may be that just sort of looking at the equivalent of crossbar switches, or I don't know, maybe it's a ring or whatnot, that, that uh, that's uh, most likely to sort of see the light of day. And another question is, so are you thinking of networks that carry around the kind of uh, photons? Right, uh, uh, yeah, here implicit, right? the, my collaborator is really an optical person, and so I was thinking of this as photonic uh, network. But it doesn't have to be, there's also work in microwave uh, networks as well. I think, I think let's take the rest of the questions offline. Okay, thanks. <laughs>